Hey everyone, and welcome back to another Unreal C++ tutorial. So, we're going to pick up where we left previously, where we're implementing the character functionality. Last time we finished up with all of the header file stuff included, so we've got the functions declared. I've implemented some of the functions in the code file, but not actually given them any logic. And the same for the variables and components, they're all ready to go. So, if we head back over to the code file to begin with, I'm going to go to the constructor and this is where we're going to implement the components that we've created and this is something which is really important to mention is that even though we have declared the components here for the spring arm component the camera component and the static mesh component they don't actually exist yet if we were to compile this and load the character class sometimes you may see some kind of reference to them like a weird empty slot but they will not actually be in the components section you won't be able to manipulate and update the uh, the components themselves so to get this working this is one thing that we do absolutely need to do in c and there's no kind of blueprint alternative like i mentioned previously like swapping out a mesh actually getting the mesh to appear is done here so the way we do this is if we do the spring arm component first of all so we'll find the spring arm comp which is what we called it we then want to say this equals to something so we want to actually make it exist so equals and the function we want to call for this is create default sub object okay so we need to give this a type so we've got this type of brackets to declare that we're giving it a type and the type is going to be the u spring arm component so that is the actual class type in the Unreal Engine, not the Spring Arm Comp, which is the name we gave it. And then we want to give this some text to close this off. So I've just called this the Spring Arm Comp, and then close that off with the semicolon. And I'm just seeing here that it's saying that it doesn't uh, know what that is, it's undefined. And that is just because I didn't give the, the name a P at the end of that one. So we just rename that to Spring Arm Comp, save that, and that should go away in time. There we go. Okay, so we now have the Spring Arm component created we also need to attach this uh, relative to something else in the class setup so we now want to get the spring arm comp that we've just set up so same again and this time we're going to call a function in the component so we use this identifier and we're going to say setup attachment i'm going to set this up to something called the root component so the root component is something which already exists in the in the class itself this is just the the actual root component in the editor window so if we just quickly go back over to unreal i'm just going to create a temporary blueprint class based on this i'm not going to keep it so i'm not going to name it but as it is at the moment the object which is the root component is the capsule component it's the highest in the hierarchy here and this is basically again this is another one of those things which is set up in the parent class so you'd need to go into the character class to see how that's done and perhaps the pawn if it's set up in the actual pawn version so i'm just going to come back in and get rid of that but that's what the root component is uh, in reference to now the next problem we'll have is that we're now actually calling functions inside of the component and um, this like i mentioned previously this class doesn't know anything about those components or the functions that it has so for the header what we did remember is we added this forward declaration of uh, just declaring the class and then just that component itself this time for the code because we're using the function this is where we need the slightly heavier version with more information so we're going to use an include and quite simply we say include and then we want the location that this component is stored in the in the engine library which is the game framework uh, then forward slash and then spring arm component and what we see here is we get the option for spring arm component dot h so we want a reference to the header file because again remember the header file is the public file so this is the one we have access to uh, and this will give us the information for the functions which are available inside of this component and there you go you can now see that the uh, the red squiggly has gone away and that is how we include references to other classes if you don't know obviously over time you'll start learning these but if you're just getting started and you don't know where you would find that or how you would know that uh, really the easiest thing i found is unless you've got certain tools uh, like visual assist it's quite hard to dive into the library and find out exactly where this is so simply go to google type in c plus plus spring arm component and on the documentation at the very bottom of the page in fact i'll show you now okay so google c plus plus spring arm component and feel free to spell it incorrectly with the um without spaces and anything that actually kind of helps because then it knows exactly what you're looking for uh search for that first option we get the api unreal documentation you can see the u spring arm component so we know that that is the class that we're wanting because it's the u spring arm and then at the bottom of this bit of documentation very easy to find we can see that the header that this class is located is runtime never need to include that one engine don't need to include the engine classes don't need to include that so everything after classes is going to be what you're looking for in 
any of the classes that you're trying to include. So the important bit is game framework, which we already have, and then springarm component.h. So that's how you know how to include something. Very simple. Just go to documentation, like I said, and in all of the C++ classes, it will always be at the bottom of that page. And it's everything after the word classes that you need. Never, you never need to include runtime, engine, or classes. Okay, so that's how we include that. And again, because I know that we're going to start adding the other things whilst we're up here, I'm just going to add the reference to our camera. So a very similar process. Okay, so I actually ended up including a few extra there um, as I was thinking about what we needed. So I think we need these for the input components. We're going to be adding input in this video, so we'll probably need these. Uh, you can always try and comment these out if you wanted to, if you want to try and keep things as small in the references as possible. But um, I've got a feeling we need these for the inputs to work. We definitely need the static mesh, so components, static mesh component, and camera forward slash camera component, uh, so that we can add the camera and the static mesh component in a moment. But like I said, I think we will need these when we start adding in the inputs. So feel free to follow along and copy those in. And then if we just return back down here, we have the spring arm set up. There's one thing I wanted to show you. So again, just kind of return to what I mentioned a few videos ago. You can do all of the setup for the spring arm in code if you wanted to, but this is another one of those things where it's gonna be much easier for us to do this in the blueprint class that we set up. So for example, one of the things if you're familiar with spring arms is you can set the length of the spring arm uh, and this is very simple to do here. So, so we can see here we get the option to set the target arm length on the spring arm component. And we simply say this equals to a value and we can say something like 400 as the value. So that now means that when we compile this, the spring arm will be a default length of 400. Now sometimes this is fine. You can set these up as like default values knowing that they're going to be overridden anyway. But this is another one of those things where I don't really see the value in this because these components will always come with a default value in there. There's nothing that you can add in this way on a component that will break it if you do not define it with a default value. However, it's always likely that they will be updated by the designer or yourself in the future when you're tweaking and playing with things. And this is another thing that you don't want to come back in repeatedly and compile the project every single time you just want to change the value from 400 to 500 to 600 testing out different values so i'm not going to include this that was just an example of what you can do but anything that you can do in blueprints in the editor um, to manipulate the spring arm or the cameras you can always call a function relevant to that in c plus as well but this is what i mean we're in in this project we're just going to set up the very bare minimum in c plus at least when it comes to design oriented things. We're going to try and do most of the functionality in C++, but when it comes to design and quick tweaks like that, we're going to leave that for the blueprint class. So we're going to move on to the camera component. So uh, we'll set that up in the same way. So I won't give this too much time because it is very, very similar. Okay, so just to recap, now that that's done, the same thing here. So we created the default sub object so the camera actually exists in the editor window. And then we set the attachment. This time, rather than the root component, we've attached it to the spring arm component, which is just the standard setup. So you create a spring arm and then you attach a camera to it. So we can attach this. This setup attachment doesn't always need to reference the root component. Uh, you can attach it to any other existing component that you've uh, specified in the C++ class here. Okay, so again, with the mesh component, we're doing the same thing, creating the default sub object, and we are just attaching this one back to the root component again. Uh, which will be, if you remember, the capsule collider so that the static mesh will sit inside of the capsule co collider. Now, the last two things we want to do in the constructor, we're going to set a default value for the base turn rate and the base lookup rate. Uh, these, because these are variables that we make, if people did forget to implement these, then they're going to be left to zero and it can confuse people why you're not looking around. So this is one of those times where I'd say just giving a default value over not can be the preferred approach even if that does get updated quite often by the designer. So we'll say base turn rate equals uh, 45, and we'll give the same to the base lookup rate as well. Okay, so just thinking about it now, it says that's undefined, which means I've probably spelled that wrong in the other folder, uh, other file, so base lookup at rate. So we'll just get that version, place that in there. Okay, so just make sure you spell those correctly. Uh, now the other thing I just realized, we probably won't be using the begin play because we're setting these variables on the constructor. So we can go back in, just really uh, clean this up and get rid of any functions that we don't need. Make sure you do that in the header file as well. And that means we can now move on to our 
input component. So again, I'll explain these once and then just input the rest in the background. So what we want to do for an action binding, which we only have one of, we want the player input component. And this is where we reference the, the names that we gave these in the input section under the project settings. So we're going to get the player input component, which is the uh, value being passed around here. So this already exists for us. We want to bind an action to this button. So bind action, bind an action to this component, sorry. And the one that we have, which is the action, is our jump button. So I just called that jump. So this is the bit which needs to be typed as it was in the project settings when you created your button inputs. And for an action, we have two options. We have the first one, which is IE underscore pressed. So input event underscore pressed. We then get a reference to this, so this class. And the, the delegate here, which is going to be uh, the wrapper, which is the type of class, which will be our character class. So we need to use the ampersand and then the A character class, which is actually referencing, if you remember, the parent class. This is a type of character class. And the character class has something built in by default, which is the jump function, which is under the movement component. So that's what we're calling here. Okay, so you'll notice that uh, we haven't made a jump function, whereas for the others, we will be using the functions that we've made. But for this one, we're getting the parent class, which is our A character. We're going into this because we know it's got a movement component. We know it's going to have a jump function, and we're just calling that jump function. Now, I'm just going to copy this one rather than typing all of that again. And there's only a couple of things we need to change. So we still want this to be a bind action. We want this to be under jump. But this time, we want to change the input event to released. Okay, so again, still referencing this. And under the A character class again, this is again just a standard. You might have done this type of thing in Blueprint where you once you've pressed jump, you then want to call the stop jump function to... Uh, update that tally so if you're doing double jumps and stuff it will take one off of the number of jumps you have left okay so we'll call stop jumping so that is that's how you assign an action so you've got the name of the button in the project uh, whether it's been pressed or released and then the function you want to call when you've pressed it or released it so this is fine for jump uh, if you had something like a weapon obviously this doesn't have default functions under the character class so instead of a character, you'd call the a yt character base here. Uh, and if we had a weapon, we'd say call the fire function, which would then relate to one of these up here. And that's what we're going to do now for the axis mappings. So again, we want the player input component. This time, instead of bind action, we're going to bind axis. And then from this point, it's, it's very similar again. So uh, the first axis we're going to bind is our move forward axis. Again, this references the next bit, the user class is ourself, so this. And this time, because this is calling a function that we've actually defined ourself in this class, we're going to get a reference, so the ampersand, to a yt character base. And then to call that function, we want to get the double colons, and then we want our move forward function. Okay, so that now means that whenever we are uh, recording this axis as being pressed so whenever the move forward button is being pressed uh, it will be calling the move forward function because this is an axis of course this is going to be run constantly until you release this so we don't need the pressed or released it's just going to be returning the value and because this is an axis it will already expect this float value to be getting passed in so we don't need to worry about that here uh, but this will return the float value which is going to be from minus one to one depending on whether it's a positive or a negative force being applied such as the analog being up or down so this is going to be the same thing we're going to be doing for all of our other axis bindings so again i'm just going to put these on and i'll leave it running in the background so you can see the implementation but there's not really anything to explain past what i just have Saying that, I just realized that for the turning of the character, it's actually going to be best to use the pawn class. So again, when it comes to hierarchy, the class that we've made is a child of the character class, as we've looked at a couple of times. The character class is a child of the pawn class, which means the pawn class has some information in there that we can use as well. So we're going to do that here. So when we're turning, uh, we want to reference the a pawn. And we want to call the function which is uh, based on the controller class, which is add controller your input. And this just means we don't need to add any specific functions for the camera rotation. Uh, we can just set the camera to inherit the rotation of the controller, which is a very standard thing to do. And that's how we do that in C++. 
So I just wanted to break back in to mention that because it's, um, I forgot that we'd be using that. So we're gonna do the same thing for the look up. Uh, we're gonna call the pawn again. And this time, uh, rather than Yule, we're just gonna change this to add pitch input. Okay, but with that done, the last two are gonna be uh, just using the functions that we've made again. So I will go back to doing that. Okay, so the last two were for the turn rate and the lookup at rate, which are just calling the turn rate and the lookup at rate functions. The reason for that is that these are gonna be for the controllers and that just works slightly different to the mouse. Uh, whereas we can get the direct uh, value of Yule and pitch input for those. It doesn't quite work the same for controllers. So we've got our own functions just to make sure that this works nicely. Okay, so I am recording this whilst I'm actually going through and editing the video. This tutorial ended up as um, well over 30 minutes uh, and this video has obviously gone over the 15 minute mark. It starts getting a little bit hard to edit and also I think it's going to be a little bit messy for people to follow along with. So I'm going to cut this video short for this tutorial and I'm going to end this one here. Uh, and I'm going to split the code for the character into two different videos. I just think that's going to make a bit more sense. So we've done the input thing today. Uh, and I will try and get the next one out as soon as possible rather than waiting the full week to at least get that topic wrapped up. By the end of the next video, we will have all of the movement and everything in though. Uh, all of the functions will be complete. So make sure you keep an eye out for that one. Hopefully this isn't too annoying that I've uh, decided to cut it up. Unfortunately, the software that I use as well does become very, very sluggish. Anything past kind of 10, 15 minutes of footage. It can lag for several seconds every time I need to cut something out or just make some small tweaks to sound and stuff. So for these reasons, I'm just going to cut these into videos of around 15 minutes. So I'll leave this one here for today. As always, if you do enjoy the videos or find them useful, please do leave a like and share the video around. That always helps. And of course, don't forget to hit the subscribe button to be kept up to date with any of the content coming from any of the playlists on the channel. And as ever, thanks for watching and I will see you all next time.